Good morning. We're going through the Bible, and we're at the book of Philemon for this year. So we have our Bible reading challenge, and, and I want to make mention of uh, those who have turned in their cards, and, and we have several who did that. But some of you uh, may have read your Bible this uh, week and, and were continuous in that but did not sign a card. We have a few, seems like, every week. But if you did not turn in your card, we want to count you. Uh, is there anyone in this section over here who did their Bible reading challenge but did not turn in a card? Everybody did. Wonderful. What about this section right here? Everybody did. Wonderful. In this section, any others? How about the last section? Now, don't be scared to raise your hand because no one over here did. <laughs> All right. Everybody, everybody filled out a card. Wonderful, wonderful, and uh, it's good to have our Bible reading challenge. And we're in the book of Philemon as we go through our Bible challenge and preaching along with what we are reading. But uh, before we begin, I, uh, my heart is heavy this morning that uh, Danny Daniels, uh, you know he's struggling, and, and um, Patty and the family and such, and, and I just want to have a a prayer this now at this time for the Daniel family. And let's bow at this time. Oh, Lord God, we, we bring before you Danny and Patty and their family, thinking of the good things which they've touched our lives with and, and uh, the love that we have for them and that they have for us. And we know what the church family means to Danny and Patty, and, and we pray that we be there during this time as he's unable to be here with us and and yearns to be with us, but his health is failing so rapidly. But his faith is not. And we see that his faith is stronger every day. And we know that that's what sees us through the time such as this. We pray that you be with him and help him and giving him patience during this time, strength during this time, physical and spiritual. Be with Patty especially as we uplift her and that we be there with her and for her and, and help her through these times. Father, we lean upon you. Your promises are sure. Your steadfast love is everlasting. And your mercy and grace is overflowing. And Father, we know that you have these two in the palm of your hands, and all is well. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue to remember Danny and Patty throughout this week and let them know that you have them in your prayers. In the book of Philemon, a short little book, just a one-chapter book, and, and sometimes you may say, well, what significance is it because it was not written to a, a church. It was just written to an individual. It was not written to an individual covering spiritual matters as far as doctrine or something that, that needs to be taken care of, but it was written to an to a individual taking care of personal matters. And so if Paul was going to take time to write to, to an individual about personal matters, how can that help us today? What significance is there to have the book of Philemon in the Bible? But because it is in the Bible, we know that it is significant. Because it is in the Bible, that we know that it does pertain to each one of us. It deals, I would say this, to sum up the book of Philemon, it deals with forgiveness. Is there anyone that, or any time, that we've had in our life that for some reason or another that we need to forgive someone. If that's happened to you, we need to turn to the book of Philemon. Even though the word forgiveness is not found in the book of Philemon. Paul does not encourage Philemon to say, uh, you need to forgive. But that's the core of the book of Philemon. And so let's turn to the book of Philemon and and we, first of all, I said, who are these people? Who is it that, that as you read through the book of Philemon, through the first couple of verses, uh, who is writing this? First of all, it begins with the word Paul. Paul is writing this particular letter 
to Philemon. And Paul says, I I write it with my own hand. Now, Paul generally used someone uh, as a secretary as he would write and that they w- he would recite it and they would record it. And now he says, I'm writing this in my own hand, whether all the book or just part of it, as he says, I'm writing this in my own hand. It's personal with Paul. Paul, look at it as he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul is a prisoner. He does not always, as regarding himself, does not always put when he would write a letter to say, Paul, a prisoner. He is in prison at this particular time. He's writing from prison. And so he's saying, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, in other letters, you can turn back one chapter into the book of Titus, where he'd say, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. You can go back to the book of Galatians. Whenever Paul is setting forth his authority as an apostle, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Whenever Galatians chapter 1 says, you don't teach any other, follow any other doctrine than that which is preached to you, he's setting forth his authority. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. But here he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He was literally in prison because of preaching the gospel. We hear that from time to time. It still happens today. Not in Texas or Arkansas, but it does happen. There are those who are in prison for the cause of Christ, and we need to keep them in our prayers. And so Paul is the one writing this particular letter. He is an apostle. He is going about from church to church to church, encouraging those who are Christians. Writing letters, encouraging those who are Christians. And then he says, Timothy... Timothy, our brother. Now, sometimes he would describe Timothy not as a brother. Now, brother means not his physical brother, but a brother in Christ, a Christian. We call one another brother and sister. We're family. The God set up that whenever he set up the church, that we are family to one another. How do you treat your brother and how do you treat your sister? Well, I treat my brothers and sister a lot better now than, than when I was growing up. I appreciate them a lot better now than when I was growing up. I appreciate you, brothers and sisters. And so sometimes he called Timothy uh, my son in the faith. That's how special Timothy was to Paul, my brother. And he goes on to describe three people. One is Philemon, Athea, Archippus. And reading the commentaries about these, they believe he's talking to one particular family, Philemon being the husband, Aphia being the wife, Archippus being the son. And and believe that he's writing to a particular family because as he talks to these three, he says, and to the church in your house. And so as these three have together, the church meets in their house. I don't know how big their house was. I don't know how big the church was. But it was common at that time, they're not the only ones that they had the church meeting in their house. If you turn to Acts chapter 12, there they had the church meeting in the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. Now, John Mark went on some missionary journeys with Paul. But the church was meeting there in her house, and they were praying together. You turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, and you had Aquila and Priscilla, as as Paul talks to Aquila and Priscilla, mentioning to them that the church meets in your house, which is at Ephesus, the Aquila and Priscilla also had a church that met in their house in Rome. So they had one in Ephesus, they had one in Rome. And the church met in their house. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. You had a person, the church at Laodicea, meeting in a man's house. And so it was that they met together in homes. And so it it was Philemon's home. And the church is meeting together here. And he is a great influence upon the church. He said, your works and your love have have been uh, known abroad. Uh, Paul encourages him. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. Paul took time to pray, and he took time to pray for specific people. He took time to pray for the churches. But it took time to pray for individuals. There's a great lesson in that. 
pray for individuals. And then you go on down to uh, verse 10. And I beseech you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Onesimus was a former servant, a former slave of Philemon. He was not with Philemon anymore. He was with Paul. He had run away from Onesimus. Because later on in the chapter that Paul talking about whatever he owes, I will pay, it's believed that they, he either uh, stole something from Philemon or he ran up an account uh, on Philemon's behalf and did not pay that and ran away. But here's a slave owner, Philemon. Here's the slave, Onesimus. Onesimus has left Philemon and his family and run away, and then Paul meets him. I don't know the circumstances of Paul meeting him. Maybe it is that someone recognized uh, Onesimus. Maybe they had been to church in, in Philemon's house, uh, traveling through and such. Maybe Paul himself had been there, or someone other in the uh, association of Paul. And there was Philemon, and they met in the church in, in their house. And, and Philemon being a, a servant or a slave in that house, they, they recognized him. Maybe even uh, Onesimus was uh, in bonds also with Paul. Wherever Paul was, he preached the gospel. He preached the gospel to the prisoners. He preached the gospel to the guards. Can you imagine being chained to Paul? You're going to get a sermon. As long as you're chained there, he's going to talk about Jesus. He had a captive all day. He wasn't, he wasn't the, the slave. He, he wasn't the prisoner. He wasn't a captive. It was whoever was chained to him was a captive audience. Can you imagine the guards going, oh, I've got to hear about Jesus again, that old Paul. When Paul spoke, he preached the gospel. So we have a slave who's run away. We have... Philemon, a friend of Paul, and Paul writing this letter to Philemon about Onesimus. See, the, the gospel changes. Th this is who they were. When we introduce someone, this is, this is how they are, but this is not who they became. Because of the letter to, of Philemon, to Philemon, some things change. Let's look at three things that change because of the gospel. Number one, the relationship of Paul and Onesimus changed. One who was a prisoner became a spiritual father. When he introduced Onesimus, he said, Whom I have begotten in my body, I beseech you for my son, whom I have begotten, which means who, who, who has become part of our family in the gospel. A prisoner becomes a spiritual father. You have one who, who was running away from, thought he could leave his troubles behind, and he goes and he meets Paul and he learns about Jesus. I think he'd already heard about Jesus, don't you, in the church there with Philemon? Don't you think he'd already seen a Christianity with Philemon and his family? Sometimes it is, sometimes that we can be good to people that have the wrong results. Sometimes people are not ready to hear the gospel. And Onesimus was not ready to hear the gospel there with Philemon. But by the time he got to Paul, he was ready. I imagine seeds were planted. I imagine the examples were shown there with Philemon and his household. And now here's Onesimus. And he's thinking, I can't go back. I have wronged this man. And Paul says, yes, you can. Things have changed. Things change between us. I consider you my son. Onesimus considered Paul his spiritual father. You see, Jesus changes relationships. When we come together and we meet as family, Jesus changes relationships. Now, I want to preach doctrine. 
And I want to preach the truth. And if I don't preach the truth, you tell me, and, and we'll get that straightened out. I want to preach truth. Truth is important. What Jesus said about being saved is important. I want to get that right. I want to be saved. I want to preach doctrine right. What we read about worship is important. I want to worship God the way that he wants to be worshipped, not the way that, that I consider man get together and say, Let, let's worship God uh, this way or that way. Let, let's worship God the way that God wants to be worshipped. I want the church organization with, set up the way that God set it up with, with elders and with deacons and, and to, to be organized the way that he would have it and that's important but you know what else is important it's relationships brothers and sisters if we don't have relationships if we don't have that relationship where paul said i i'm not just someone i'm just not a preacher i'm just not someone who teaches you the gospel i am family to you you're my son when he goes and, and he talks to Philemon, he said, this is your brother that you are receiving. It's not just a former slave that you receive. It changes relationships. It changes relationships from a prisoner being a spiritual father. And then the second relationship, it changes. A slave becomes a brother. Someone who is a servant, who is, uh, we would say, beneath us, below us, he, he is a slave on the master. It changed the relationship to say, this is no longer a slave, this is a brother. Now, Paul said that, uh, look, look, when he reads about Onesimus, I look at verse 10, I, I beseech you for my son Onesimus. There's the relationship change between Paul and Onesimus, which in times past was to be unprofitable, but now he is profitable to you. Paul's doing a play on words here. And we don't get this w with the English. Onesimus, the name Onesimus means useful. And so I have a servant so useful to me, I have his name being useful. He'd say, hey, useful, come over here and help me. He was a servant so good, his very name is useful. And Paul said he was not useful to you previously. He was useful to you so much as a servant, but by the physical things that you even named him useful. But I'm telling you, now he is useful to you. Now he is profitable to you because now things have changed. He's not a servant to you. He's a brother to you. That's how useful. It's not the physical things that, ha that are important. It's the spiritual things. When Paul says that he ministered to me, he used the word diakonis. It means served me. Onesimus was a servant to me. Not in the sense that he was a slave to me, but he was a deacon to me. The word diakonis, servant, is the word from which we get the word deacon. When we have deacons, we have servants. The office of a deacon, the office of a servant. He said, he ministered to me as a deacon, servant, not as a slave. You see, he served you as a slave. He served me as a deacon. Things change. Things change between Paul and Onesimus. Things change between Onesimus and Philemon. He is no longer a slave. He's a brother. Things change between Paul and Philemon. Listen to what he said as, as he would say, receiving this brother that he would have unto you. And when he says that, oh, let me go to verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that you should receive him forever. He left you, but now he's coming back. Now, not as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved. Especially to me, but how much more unto you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And if you count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. 
If he has wronged you or owed you, put that on my account. Verse 19, Paul says, I've written it with my own hand. I will repay it. I do not say to thee how much you owe to me, even your own self. You see? You see what Philemon owed to Paul? Paul says, Philemon, remember, I preached the gospel to you. I saved your soul. The creditor, the one who was owed, now owes. Creditor became a debtor. Not in material things, but in spiritual things. What's important? Matthew 16 says, What does it profit if a, gain, if a man gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Philemon, it doesn't matter how much money he owes you. That, that's not important. And that's where I say forgiveness comes in. He, paid a, he, he owed a debt he could not pay. And Paul says, if he owes anything, I will pay it. I think it's important when Paul says, put that on my account. We have the, you know, I grew up at a time, we would go to, there's a little mom and pop grocery store there at the school at Genoa. If you've been down to Genoa, you know where the school is. It's Purefoy's Groceries right now. When I was growing up, the Lambs uh, owned that store, Earl Lamb. And so we'd go to the Lamb's little convenience store. And we had a charge account there. And that was wonderful. Uh, there were five of us kids, and all five of us, we, we'd go in there to that little store, and we'd get us some candy, and we didn't have to pay any money. It didn't cost anything. We would say, charge it, please. And he would take out his, his little ticket, and he would write down to Mon Holland's uh, for Mom and Daddy and how much it was that we took. And, and that was just a wonderful thing. Charge it, please. I didn't have to have any money. Uh, later on, I, I learned what charge it, please, the full significance of that is. But I didn't know when I was growing up. There are five of us kids. That, and so we, Mr. Lambs told Daddy one time, he said, I, I can't hardly tell your kids apart. There's, there's so many of them. If some kid comes up and says, charge it, please, I just put it on your account. Uh, Daddy didn't know if he's kidding or not. <laughs> but charge it. Just put it on my account. See, I received the debt. I got the candy or the Coke or whatever it was. But I didn't pay the debt. Someone else did. And Paul says... To Philemon, if Onesimus owes you anything, put it on my account. He said, I am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it. Onesimus owed the debt. Paul said, I will pay it. Relationship changed. He said that which is physical is really not important, Philemon. You owe me a debt also, which is your spiritual soul, your life, spiritual life. Put that on my account. Think about this. When Paul says, Onesimus owed a debt, but I, Paul, am paying that debt. You owe a debt. You owe a debt you cannot pay. Remember Jesus talking about the forgiveness and owing a debt? In Matthew chapter 18, he, he said this, this man owed a debt to his master. And the master said, pay me. And he said, have mercy upon me, and I will pay. He paid a debt. He, it's not even possible that he could pay. And the master had mercy and forgave that debt. A debt not possible to pay. He forgave it. Instead of that servant going back to those who owed him, he went back to someone who owed him some money. Instead of having mercy toward him, 
He said, pay me what you owe me, which is just a small amount of money. And the man said, have mercy upon me. I will repay. He said, no, I'm not going to have mercy. I'm going to have you thrown into prison until you pay that debt. See, we have a debt we cannot pay. Spiritual debt. And Jesus said, I will pay it. It's a debt we cannot pay. It's a spiritual debt. And Paul took in pen and wrote to Philemon, I will repay it. I'm writing this in my own handwriting. And Jesus didn't take pen in hand. He paid it in blood. Paid in full. There's a debt we owe, we cannot pay. There's a debt he paid. He did not owe. Have we, like the young slave Onesimus, run away from our family, our Christian family, got tied up into the world and all the things and, and have run up a debt, and now we've met someone who said it's time to go home. It's time to go back to where you belong. It's time to be received as family. Don't you know Onesimus was scared to death? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe Paul uh, had so much confidence in, in, with Philemon, he said, you go back and you're going to be received as family, as brother. How would you feel going back Uncertainty, fear, maybe yearning, because this is now family. We, we want those who have gone away from home to come back and be received as family. We want forgiveness to be foremost in receiving one. One who has left our family in, in coming back. How are they treated? Are they treated as outcasts? Are they treated as, as those who are estranged family or accepted freely? Paul said accept him. Accept him as you would accept myself. That's how Paul said. You see, you have a a person, and a payment, and a pardon. Paul said, when you accept the Nismus, um, you accept him as myself, as you would receive me and have received me. And the, and the payment, whatever he owes, I'm going to pay it. You will be repaid. And we have that pardon. A person, a payment, and a pardon. That's the story of the cross. Right. The person is now Jesus. The payment. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And he paid that debt for us. And the pardon. The debt is paid. All is forgiven. What a wonderful story of Philemon and Onesimus and Paul. The story of a second chance. The story of changed relationships. And that's the church. Family. Brothers and sisters. Is there anyone that, that would say is a prodigal son? Onesimus, a servant that needs to come back home? Is there anyone else we can reach out to to say, let me tell you, the debt is paid, your family. Is there anyone considering being, becoming a Christian, making that decision to become 
a child of God, to become part of the family here at Hampton, that brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus paid the debt. Your sins are forgiven. That you come and you confess, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I want to make him Lord of my life. Repenting of those sins and, and being baptized, going down into the water, have your sins washed away. Come up out of the water. Romans says to walk in newness of life. Won't you make that decision right now while we stand and while we sing?